very special occasion in Stamford Church. And on behalf of St um, Mary's Church and the PCC, we welcome you, all of you, to this wonderful William Dixon Homecoming Council. And in particular, we welcome those who travel a long way, a lot of people come a long way for this very special occasion. Particularly, we welcome Matt in Seattle for initiating the fun concert, an inspirational idea to bring it here, back to the home of William Dixon. And also, a warm welcome to all the performers who we very much look forward to hearing. We're also most grateful to the William Dixon Foundation who have promoted the evening and to both the Lowland and Border Piper Society and the Northumbrian Piper Society for their generous support for this occasion. <clears throat> William Dixon is one of our favourite and famous sons, having been baptised here in this church in 1678 and buried with many of his family in the churchyard of Stamford and St Mary's Churchyard. Matt St. Seattle and Julia say will definitely provide us with much information of its importance to our local culture. I'm asked to make sure that everybody has turned off their mobile phones. When we break for the interval, there will be refreshments and snacks at the back of the church. And we also invite everybody to wander around and enjoy the historic church and particularly to look at the William Dixon Family Memorial on the north wall by the chancel entrance. I now hand you over to Julia, <coughs> who will give us historical information about William Dixon and his connection with the area and with the origin of the pipes. Julia. Um, William Dixon, there were four of them. It's, more, it's incredibly complicated. They're an extended family living mainly in Fenwick, which for those of you who are not local is a, a small hamlet about a mile west of here, and Ingo, which is two miles further on on top of a hill. The first reference I can find to the family definitely is in the muster rolls of 1538. Henry VIII decided that he needed to know how many fighting men were available in the borders. There were two Dixons, Edward and Ingram at Ingo, and James at Fenwick. Uh, they were neither well horsed nor harnessed, it says. However, their landlord, was, I think it was Sir Ralph Fenwick, who was living at Fenwick at the time, in Fenwick Tower, which is now sort of accessible, um, was their landlord. He was deputy keeper, a deputy warden of the Middle March, with special responsibility for quelling North Tynedale, which basically in those days was a license to do whatever way he wanted to get his to get the, the job done. Um, it can't be a coincidence that the Dixon family started their rise to considerable prosperity over the ensuing years till the, till the Union of the Kingdoms. Um, the Reaver culture went on for some years after 1603. I found one reference in the quarter sessions to a Dixon who stole five sheep and a weather uh, and in 1629, so there was some 20 years after all this sort of thing was supposed to have been stopped. So they weren't entirely respectable, but they quickly achieved respectability. The parish records for this parish don't start until 1660. Until then, we're reliant on the county history and the references available in it, some of which are extremely obscure and difficult to find, even in these days of the internet. Um, in 1660, a, a William Dixon, because as I say, there were several over several generations, 
was a church warden in this parish. He, he and his brothers and members of his extended family were respectable members of the parish, so they weren't either Catholic or openly Catholic, because they would have failed the test acts that uh, would have been in place at the time. Uh, nor were they non-conformists of any sort. Um, they must have been sufficiently conforming to be part of the Anglican community here. Uh, the records are not entirely comprehensive and as I say it was an extended family. The first generation of interest is some adults who were flourished in the 1690s. There was a Percival Dixon who was apprenticed in Newcastle in the 1690s to a scrivener, that's a professional writer. Or he would have been taught writing, uh, legal Latin documentation. He probably would also have been taught her heraldry. Those of you who will have seen this memorial and who will see it will see what I mean. I think the top portion of that memorial was done by Percival Dixon because he had the skills, possibly assisted by a stonemason, but the artistic bit of it, it required considerable skill of the sort which he would have learned. Percival had what was probably a brother called Robert. He entered the church and had considerable patronage. In 1696, I think William and Mary would have been on the throne, yes, still, or was it just William? Um, and he became vicar of Aldermaston down in Berkshire, a post he held until 1729, which makes him a close relation to the vicar of Bray, because the religious sort of ambience of the times changed several times in that period. Um, and Robert Dixon of Aldermaston has descendants who I have um, corresponded with briefly and shared information with. Uh, and the third brother, there was a William and there was a John. Now these names occur in generation after generation. I can't directly link those four to William Dixon Senior, who is the first one mentioned on the memorial here, but there was William Senior of Fenwick and William Junior of Fenwick, and they were both having children baptised at the same time. So, unless the parish clerk recorded which one the children actually belonged to, it's, it's a huge disentangling job to work out exactly who is related to who. We know that the manuscript was written after 1721 because one of the tunes in it was about a chap called Jackie Layton who died in 1721 and the tune was composed very shortly thereafter, we think, and it spread very widely through the British Isles. He was Irish. Uh, it's beautifully written. The book, it's quite small apparently. I've not seen the original, though I've got scans. It, the music itself is written in one hand, it's one person has written it, but there are title pages and names in it which are in several hands. There is a Percival Dixon, a John Dixon, and a William Dixon, and it was that combination of names, particularly the Percival, that initially led Matt here. There are Dixons here and around about here, and there is another patch of Dixons up by Holy Island and on the mainland, and there are none in between in the Morpeth area. Hello, sorry, yes? I, do, I just think it might be interesting to know that um, we inherited many, many of these, and one of them is this I'll speak to you later. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, by the time we get to the date of the manuscript, there are two dates on it, 1733 and 1738. The Dixon family, and I have to use it as a kind of unit, were doing quite well for themselves. They inhabited probably Low Hall Lingo. There are three 
buildings called Hall, Dingo, although it's a small village. There's North Hall, of which only the stable block, I think it is, it still exists. There's South Hall, which is a beautiful building built, built in the 1670s by the Shafto family, or one branch of it. And there's Low Hall, which now is a, is a large farmstead and contains within its fields the remains of the medieval village, which was wasted in the 14th century. Um, William Dixon, the William Dixon family, the Percival Dixon, by the 1730s had a house in Newcastle on Westgate Street, somewhere near the assembly rooms. We haven't pinpointed the number exactly, we think we have, but we've, we've yet to work out which building it might have been in place of. Um, they weren't what we would rudely refer to as peasants. They were middling sorts. They were prosperous tenant farmers. Some of them were owners. Uh, William Dixon was well off enough to lend money to a, an impoverished member of the Shafto family at one point. I'm jumping about a little bit in time here. Uh, on the memorial here we have William Dixon Senior and his wife Isabel of Ingo. Uh, they are low hall. They had a numerous family and unfortunately quite a few of them died in infancy. So there was a William who died aged two, there was another one who died aged one, and the William, the William that survived to age 24 was the, actually the youngest of about ten children. Uh, we think, I think that the manuscripts came from William Senior, who is on the memorial, to his son John. John ran at one stage a small coal mine, which for, the local, for those of you who do know the area, it's in, as you go from here to Fenwick, there's a little wood opposite Fenwick Tower, and I think it was there. Uh, small, there, there were numerous small coal mines throughout Northumberland which supplied the local area, the very local areas. Uh, his son, William, took over the coal mine, and by now we're in the 1740s, 1750s, 1760s, getting up to with William. Uh, and John left his property to William, who went off to Scotland, having managed the coal mine here and did quite well for himself managing a coal mine near Glasgow. His son bought an ironworks at a time when the Industrial Revolution was happening and did extremely well for himself. He, if you Google William Dixon Ironmaster Glasgow, he was one of the really big uh, um, foundry owners. He, by the end of his life he had a country estate he had a cottage over near Perth, and that, I think, is how the manuscript left here and went up to Scotland. It went with the William Dixon who was born in 1753, so it would have left Northumberland perhaps in about 1790. But once the music was written out, it wasn't altered at all. There are a few annotations in the book where obviously a child has got hold of it, um, and there are little drawings and scribbles on it, which don't add enormously to our knowledge, but it hasn't been defaced in any way. Um, Matt concentrated on the music, <laughs> because he plays the pipes that we, we believe most of it was played on. It's written in a bagpipe scale, um, I think that's fair to say. Some of the tunes are readily playable on what we now call the Northumbrian small pipes. Some of them are naturally more suited to the border pipes, the bigger pipes. Both were played in the area. This was a hugely important area for piping. To, in the village we have the ancestors of the Reed family who became very famous pipe makers in North Shields around 1800 and who, turned, who added keys to the instrument and turned it into what Northumbrian small pipers play today. To the west of us we have uh, at Chipchase Castle Colonel John Reed, who was the colonel of one of the Northumberland militia regiments in the Napoleonic Wars, and he commissioned a set of border pipes which still exists and is in the Morpeth Chantry Museum. So there were pipes in the area. This was also um, a way that travellers went north and south, there were, there were routes over the hills, 
and we know there were traveller families who played. I think, but I haven't yet proved it, that we have an uncle of the infamous Jimmy Allen living at Little Bavington Mill, no longer exists, but the, the, you would see where it would be, about four miles from Ingo. So there is a huge musical community. What we don't know is whether any of the William Dixons themselves actually played or whether they were writing, it, writing the music down that was in the area. And I don't think we ever will. Um, Matt would love to think of William. We would love to think that the music was played in this church. Uh, but whether it was in the pub across the road. More likely in the pub across the road. I think that's fair <laughs> comment. <laughs> so, um, the manuscript went north into Scotland, was uh, retrieved from an elderly chap on the Athol estate by a lady who rejoiced in the name of Lady Dorothea Brubbles Rice, my member of the Athol family. And she bought it and said it was a uh, jigs and uh, reels of the border country, which, yes it is. Um, and then it disappeared from sight again until uh, a chap called Mick Bacchus and Matt, I think, discovered it more or less simultaneously. Or, um, and Matt just um, took it from there, really, which is exactly what I think we should do now. Um, during the interval, I'd be delighted to sort of ram ramble on about the memorial behind me. Do come and have a look if you haven't seen it. But meanwhile, I think I should hand over to Matt and the musical section of the, um, the, the evening. Thank you. Thank you.